testing. One, two. I'm on there now. Testing. One, two, three. It's on. Testing. I think your volume is still off. You got your green audio box check? Not real sure. I am. I'm, I have not stopped talking. Okay. What input is that on? I'm not real sure. Okay.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So glad to see everyone here this morning. Welcome to Pilgrim Valley. We are located at 1821 Wolf Street, where our pastor is Patrick H. Green, Sr. We are about to begin our morning service. Could we please stand? All right, now. Come on, clap with me. I know God, my God, God is good. God, my God, God is good. You know he brought me out of darkness. God is good. Said that he saved my soul. God is good. Said that he saved my soul. God is good. Said that he saved my soul. And he brought me out of darkness. God is good. You know that he guided my every footstep. God is good. Yeah. Said that he, he guides my every footstep. And he saved my soul. And he brought me out of darkness. God is good. You know, he put food on my table. God is good. Yeah. Say he put food on my table. God is good. Oh, yeah. Say he put food on my table. And he put shoes on my feet. So he could guide my every footstep. Jesus saved my soul. And he brought me out of darkness. God is good. You know that he made a way. God is good. Said that he made a way. God is good. You know that he made a way. And he put food on my table, and he put shoes on my feet, so he could guide my every footstep. Jesus saved my soul, and then he brought me out of darkness. God is good. You know that he healed my every sickness. God is good. Said that he heals my every sickness. God is good. Said that he heals my every sickness. With no money in my pocket, he still made a way out of no way. And then he brought me out of darkness. God is good. Amen. Amen. This morning I'll be reading from you Psalms, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 3. I love you, Lord. Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and thy throne of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon you, Lord, who is the worthy of my praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. I have read you Psalms, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 3. May the Lord have a blessing upon the hearers, the doers and the readers of his word. Let us pray. 
This morning, we Father, we come to you once again, thanking you for most of your glory and your praises. For we know that it is you that has brought us through this week, protecting us, making sure that no harm or enemy comes harm to us. We ask that you bless our church, bless our members, look out for our pastor. We thank you this morning for Reverend Smith. We ask that you guide him and give him his word that you may inspire him throughout our blessings today. We love you, Lord, Amen. and we thank you. Amen. 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 Yes, God is good. Yes, he is. All right now. He said a lot in there, but he said he saved our souls. And on this communion Sunday, we just, we reflect on that. He saved our souls. Thank you, Lord. Let's talk about power. There is power 
in the master.
y'all would have been in Sunday school this morning. Hey, I read it. I'm telling you, they, they Sunday I school, read it. Yeah. Were, were they on time? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. I'm telling you, it, it was like, it was like at the wrap up of the Sunday school, we could have just said, there it is. <laughs> Praise y'all, God. Y'all say, yeah. bring, bring us on home. And you did. Praise God. still does. He looks out into our world and he sees broken lives, broken families, people's minds in disarray, and he calls out to this broken world, ho, ho, everyone that thirsteth, come, 
Come to the fountain and drink. Get water without price. I have what your soul needs. I've paid the price. Please come. Oh, what a joy it is to be in the Lord's house this morning. You know, David said, I was glad when they said, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. But it's even better to get here. <laughs> I mean, it, it can make you glad to know you're going, but boy, when you get to the house of the Lord and you have time to be in his word and time to pray, time to reflect on the truths of his word and song and hear sincere expressions from the soul of gladness for understanding what the Lord's redemption means. Yeah, yeah, let's be glad in this day. I want to greet all of you who are present in the assembly this morning and those who are listening uh, online or watching by our website. It's a blessing to be here, and I pray God's blessings upon each of you who have defeated the enemy and attempts to dissuade you from being present in this place. And come here because the presence of the Lord will, is here among us and will bless you for worshiping with his people. I uh, got word from Pastor Green this morning. We had a brief interchange of messages, and he's doing well. The surgery was successful uh, on his knee, and uh, in fact, he feels like he's doing better this time than the first time by uh, uh, this particular phase of recovery. So continue to keep him and the Green family in your prayers. I want to continue our thoughts from last week as we began in the first epistle of the Apostle Peter in the first chapter on the subject of God's might for our manifold temptations. Peter expressed that that is something that every believer should expect, that we will go through things that will test our faith. As James says, you believe in God? <laughs> The devils also believe and tremble. But if you truly have faith in God, when hardship comes, when trials comes, when the unexpected occurs, you will have an anchor for your soul. You will have resource from God that will enable you to get through those things with triumph, with gladness, and with praise to God. And last week we studied down through the first nine verses of 1 Peter chapter 1. And today we'll pick up there and my, the, we'll use the old, same overarching theme of God's might for our manifold temptations. But I have a little bit more uh, appropriate or, or more direct thought for the text of today that picks up where we left off at verse 10. And maybe this will help you take this home with you. Get ready for a rough ride. <laughs> Getting ready for a rough ride. Some years back, I was traveling east on 4th Street downtown here at Little Rock. I was approaching Broadway with a green light ahead. And I entered that intersection, confident I was on my way to Main Street for a destination I had at the time. Unfortunately, as I approached the middle of Broadway, there was a car northbound on Broadway that ran the red light. I had already entered the intersection, crossed the first two lanes of traffic, and was approaching the other side, and the other car entered and slammed into the right side of my car. I, I had caught a glimpse out of my right eye and applied the brakes as firmly as I could, set the car up. You know, if any of y'all ever been in the car where you try to put your foot through the floorboard to stop it, <laughs> you can see that rear end just, just hike up. Oh, had that moment, <clears throat> wasn't enough. Car still came and plowed right in the right side of my car, and immediately there was an explosion. 
the uh, the airbag in the um, steering wheel exploded right in my face and forced me back and I don't know how many of you ever that was my second time to experience that uh, but uh, you don't get ready for it even if you've had it before there's no it, it happens too fast and it is such a sudden explosion that and it literally is an explosion uh, it's like setting off a couple of firecrackers next to your ears and uh, because the first thing that, that, that happens once your eyes kind of refocus is there's just this ringing you know, in your ears. And of course, the, both cars came to a screeching halt. Uh, fortunately, I had slowed up enough that it, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. It wasn't a, a, a straight T-bone. And uh, the uh, uh, lady in the other car who was driving, uh, she had a, a, a minor child in the car with her, and fortunately, they both were uninjured. And thanks to the safety precautions in the vehicle I was driving, I was uninjured. The seat belt and the restraint across and the combination of that with the airbag spared me any significant injury. I didn't even get a whiplash. Uh, and, uh, you know, everyone wonders about it at first. You know, the police showed up and folks come out and they wonder, are you all right? Are you all right? And they're expecting you not to be, but praise God, I was fine. Uh, the lawyers didn't seem to think so because I kept getting calls from law officers wanting to know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I was fine. Life has hazards. There is a reason that roller coasters, automobiles, and airplanes come equipped with seat belts because that's a rough ride. You can have a rough ride in those things. I mean, you can just, you can get off of one of those and all your, in, you, you stop moving, but all your insides <laughs> seem to still be kind of rolling around. I've been in airplane flights where we're flying along up in the stratosphere above the clouds or, and then when we come down, uh, there's turbulence wind is, is unstable. The air is, is, is moving uh, in unpredictable ways. And the pilot, you can just, you, we're not up there, but you can just see them in there just in you know, the whole plane. You're flying along at, say, 30,000 feet or 25 as you're descending, and all of a sudden you're at 22. <laughs> the plane just drops, and you, your heart goes up, and you're like, whoa. And then all of a sudden, just a sudden side to side, and you just reach down and cinch that belt just a little bit tight. <laughs> and you hear, PM, you hear people praying in there that you didn't have any idea. Might have had faith. Because sometimes life brings rough rise. Now those happen and they're not uncommon. But you know in life there are things beside the physical that bring rough rise to us. And the purpose of Peter's letter was to prepare Christian believers for the rough rides of trying to live a life faithful to Christ, faithful to God. Last week we wrapped up with verse 9, but we pick up with verse 10 this morning. Salvation is only the beginning of the Christian life. I know there's a inaccurate perception of Christianity that somehow you become a Christian and you live according to the commandments of Christ and follow the commands of God in order to be saved. At the end of your life that hopefully your good deeds will outweigh your bad, and you'll be weighed on the scale and if your good deeds outweigh your bad, God will say you can come into my kingdom. That your judgment at the end Following your life will determine whether you can enter the kingdom of heaven. That is not the message of scripture. The message of scripture is that you can become a saved soul now. And know that you are one of his from the time of your 
repentance and faith in Christ, that when that happens, God causes you to be born again with new life. You are spiritually reborn. And in Jesus' words from John 5, passed from death unto life. And that your new birth is the beginning of your Christian life. It's the beginning of your forever life in Christ before God. It is not the end. It is the beginning. It is the time now that your faith is going to be tested. It is time now for your service to Christ not to be saved, but because you are saved and one of his. Because now you are an ambassador for him in this dying world to take the hope of life and peace and joy to those who do not have it and cannot have it outside of the knowledge that God gives through Christ. But you know there's an enemy that does not want you to succeed in that mission. Jesus gave the church through the early apostles a commission. He didn't tell them to spread the gospel so they could be saved. He told them to spread the gospel so that those who hear it could be. And it's still true. We share the good news of the salvation by grace through Christ to others, not to somehow earn salvation for ourselves, but to make sure that others who have not heard it can share what we already possess. And it's vital that we understand we're going to be opposed in that mission. And it's not going to be easy. And to use the word, the words that Peter used as we looked at last week, in verse 7 of chapter 1, Peter said that the trial of your faith, or excuse me, start at verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, we'll be glad to see Jesus. Why? Because we're already saved. We're his. We are adopted into his family. We are a part of him. And when we see him, we won't be, oh, no, I hope I didn't mess up too much. No, when we see him, we will shed tears of joy and gladness because we are glad. And so in verse 10, as we begin today's thought, salvation only the beginning. And he expresses what this salvation is, a, a salvation that though it's now being revealed more clearly, it's a salvation that has always been God's plan. And so in verse 10, Peter says this, of which salvation? He says, when, when you're going to continue faithful, if you're going to receive the salvation of your soul, that's something that God gives you by faith. He says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you, by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. He says, you guys, y'all have been so blessed that you have been given eternal life and God's revealing the plan to you. The prophets got glimpses of it. The angels have been wondering for ages how God was going to do this. And you're seeing it come to pass. Do you understand what a blessing that is? And then comes the preparation for the rough ride. <laughs> the very first 
significant verse for this morning is verse 13. Buckle up. Let's just call it verse 13. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> you know, if you're sitting somewhere and somebody tells you that, you know what that means. <laughs> You better buckle up and hold on to something. I hope somebody's holding on to you, which is fortunately our case. Buckle up. Right after reminding us about this wonderful salvation and why we have it to preserve and promote and promulgate the gospel of grace to a dying world, Peter says this, wherefore, which is the old way of saying therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Now that's old language for buckle up. Get ready. It's about to get kind of rough out here. In practical terms, what it meant in Peter's day, you know, we, we now, particularly the males, we're used to wearing trousers. We got these two-legged garments, you know, we put on in the morning and tie them on with a belt, make sure they stay in, a, in an appropriate position on our anatomy. But back in the day, men wore more of a gown type of garment. You just kind of put it on over your head, and it, it flowed down, and you would kind of put a sash around it a little bit to tighten around the waist, or maybe throw something around the shoulder, a, a little cloak uh, garment. But uh, and men often wore sandals for shoes. But sometimes when you really got to get going, when you're really in urgency, that kind of loose-fitting garment might not be the best thing for when it calls for action. If you're in a situation and you're about to be confronted, you need to kind of be able to spread out a little bit. <laughs> you need to be able to to get a firm foundation and prepare yourself. And in that day, they take that belt off, reach down, pull up that garment, and tie it up. That's girding up. It's similar. Buckle up. I mean, it's okay, now. If we if we gonna have to, we gonna have to go there. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna get ready. And that's the image. Peter is, wherefore, gird up. Now notice, he's, he doesn't tell us that this is physical. This isn't just get ready to have a fist fight or use your taekwondo knowledge. <laughs> he says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. You've got to begin to understand where you are when you are, and why you are. What's your purpose? Why will you experience opposition and adversity? You must understand that if God has sent you on a mission, and that there are those opposed to the mission of God, they will be opposed to you. And that means you've got to be ready for the things that will test you, the things that will try to discourage you, the things that will try to turn you aside from the mission God's given you. And those things will be without and within. Gird up the loins of your mind. Prepare your thought life for temptation, for testing. The next thing he says right there in that same verse, and in addition to buckling up, you, if you get in your car, you, you, one of the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to have been around before seat belts. That's old. But I, I remember the first car we got as a family that had seat belts. A 66 Pontiac we got, and it had seat belts. And we were just like, wow, look at that, man. That's, what is that? <laughs> we didn't know how to put them on, you know. But... Uh, it was, it, was, it was neat to have. I remember our old 58 Pontiac didn't have seat belts. And we had that till 66. And, uh, uh, and so we, we, were, we thought we were really on the cutting edge of technology and getting seat belts. But 
once you buckle up nowadays, you know, then they didn't trust us to buckle up. They started making cars that buckle you in all by themselves. Uh, but uh, in addition to buckling up, if you're going to operate a, a motor vehicle, if you're going to operate any kind of significant machinery that has the kind of power that that does, you better be sober. And so Peter says, be sober. And what does that tell us in, in modern terms, practically? Don't impair yourself for usefulness and service to God. Why weaken yourself? When you're getting ready to be in a situation that could cost you your life or the life of somebody you love, why would you impair yourself? If you have been called to operate on someone who has a serious condition and you're a physician, he says, I got that man's heart surgery in the morning, but I, I just got to have three more martinis. <laughs> Say, what? <laughs> and if you're getting ready to drive on a curvy road on a mountain with no guardrails, is that the time for you to decide to get a little high? No, because you'll probably get low real quick <laughs> if you make such a choice. But you have to understand, as believers living in this spiritual life, there are hazards out there that will cause you great harm and those that you have the responsibility to seek and to serve. So be sober. Do not impair yourself drinking, using drugs, being preoccupied with entertainment or conversation can cause us not to be ready for unexpected events. We got people now who walk around and completely oblivious to the world except for the little thing in their hand. There are mountains in the distance. There's a sun in the sky. There are buildings a hundred stories tall. And they're walking around. I've seen images of people walking in a hole right in the middle of the sidewalk and just walk right straight into the hole. Completely unaware. And other even more tragic situations that cost people their lives. So when we're told here to have the spiritual sense to gird up the loins, be sober. These are sincere, definite warnings to believers about the spiritual perils that are coming our way. As Peter writes a little later in his letter, he says, you shouldn't be surprised about the fiery trial <laughs> that's going to try you. you. You shouldn't be shocked about what's coming. And you won't be if you don't impair yourself. Notice also in that same verse is a, a, a powerful uh, reminder. You know, one of, the, one of the most important tools they put in an automobile, and they've been in them for a long, long time, for good reason, is the rear view mirror. You know, I'm, I'm glad now we've advanced the rear view mirror a little bit. Uh, we've got rear view mirrors now that are actually cameras that can give you a panoramic view of, from behind, unobscured by uh, parts of the car. Uh, we've got rear view mirrors now that are much clearer uh, than the old ones. We've got backup warnings uh, where you start backing up and you might be looking in the rear view mirror, but it's still something you can't see and the sensors in the back of the car start beeping and you say, whoa, wait, what, what, what is that? What? And you look a little closer and, you know, there's a child's toy or something else that you're about to make contact with and you, you become grateful. But do you know we have a spiritual corollary to the rearview mirror? Notice there in verse 13 he says, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Christ. There is a reminder to understand what Christ has done for us, 
but also an expectation to look forward to the hope that is in Christ. We can look back to our redemption and to our salvation and we can look forward to our eventual arrival in his kingdom. Clear vision, past and present, before and behind. God provides that for us and we need to accept those and live them and understand that they are there for our blessing. Remember your salvation's hope. When you get ready to enter the rough ride, I'm telling you, when, when a plane is shaking, you have no idea what's getting ready to happen. You know, roller coasters are kind of fun. At least they were when I was younger. Roller coasters were, were a joy. I loved to get on them with my kids. Why? Because you knew it was going to stop. You knew it was on a course. It was going to run its course, and then when it got through, it was going to stop. But the same thing that if you get on, if you had no clue when or if it was going to stop, that thing that was yours, all of a sudden it screams of terror. But no, Christian, when you put your faith and your trust in Christ, the fiery trials that will try you and the things that you will go through, they will be a course that God controls. And when we keep our focus and our hope on him, we will know that we will go through it, but it's going to stop. Because God's operating it. And God will not, according to his word, allow us to endure or suffer temptation beyond our ability to endure. But will, with the temptation, provide a way of escape. That pertains both to temptations to sin as well as the temptation to give up through hard times. God's with us. And then in verse 14, there's an additional help here for getting ready for a rough ride. Dress for work, not play. You know, if, if you know you're getting ready to get into something rough, you don't go out in your frillies. You go get your blue jeans, or as my father used to put on his bib overalls. He loved those things. Put on the, the bib overalls, you know, big blue overalls, and they had a, had a bib pocket right on the front. He loved to put stuff in there for, for working. And that was work time. When, you, you, when you're getting ready to do that, you need to put on the right stuff. Notice verse 14. He says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. This is vital, Christian. If you're going to be of benefit to God in this life, in service to others, to bring them to Christ, or to help Christians stay faithful, to be a light for God in this world, you must obey him. You must do as the Lord directs you to do. You're not doing it so you won't go to hell. You're doing it because you love him and you're grateful to him. And he wants to use your good works to shine his light to those around you. You're God's hands and arms of love. God's love appears to others through acts of choice that you make as his spirit moves in your life. You live a life of greed and selfishness and lust, filling just yourself. You create a dark place around yourself and no one will see light in your life. You don't want to be like that. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Not, don't live the way you used to. Don't choose the things you used to choose, but instead, honor the Lord in the directions that he gives in his word. People wonder about the consequences of sin and 
why sin is so bad. I have a message I'll share sometime or another as the Lord gives liberty call. What's so bad about sin? But it's important for Christians to understand there's a whole lot bad about sin. Not the least of which is the darkness it creates around you that deceives others about the presence of God's light and changes their perception of the possibility of hope. So many people are living hopeless lives. Young people, teenagers, who ought to be looking ahead, thinking of all the possibilities of life, can't think beyond the weekend in terms of what might be possible or what might be meaningful when God has for them so much joy, so much possibility that he can use them for and that he can bless in them, give them peace they can't imagine. Instead, they're looking at a little boy, a little girl, thinking, oh, 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 if I could only. Not understanding what they don't see will do them so much harm. Not understanding that not valuing who they are in God's eyes causes them to try to value themselves in the eyes of human beings and they are diminished in so many ways by not seeing who they are before the God who made them. So we need to dress for work, not play. And lastly, to wrap up our thoughts this morning, I know we didn't get very far into Peter, but... Uh, this is concentrated stuff and vital to understand why, as believers, we need to get ourselves ready for a rough ride. I mean, the temptations are coming, but before you even get there and before you even start dealing with it, you got to get ready for it. <laughs> I mean, you show up to football practice and you're getting ready to have contact in a contact sport. You know, the early practices, we used to practice in shorts and T-shirts. Have our cleats on and the helmet, and that's it. But when you got ready to play the real thing, you had to put on the whole armor. <laughs> and get ready, because it's not going to be easy. Somebody's going to try to take you down, and they won't mind if you get hurt. But we're not playing a game when it comes to our lives. We're not playing, we're not in a recreational sport when it comes to our prayer life, when it comes to our responsibility to learn the word of God, to wield the sword of the spirit for the protection of those we love and for the defeat of the enemy. We're not playing a game when it comes to preparing ourselves for what is coming our way. Last thing, and I keep, I'm keeping the uh, metaphor here of, of driving. I think it may be helpful to remember. Once you buckled up, made sure you're not impaired and checked out the rear view mirror as well as looking ahead to your hope, where you're going, once you get on the road, this is indispensable. You got to keep it between the lines. <laughs> oh, you, you got to keep it between the lines. Uh, I, I mean, there's a path, there's a road, and you've got to stay on it. Don't turn to the right or to the left. You have to stay on the road and keep it between the lines that God puts forth out in front of you. I love Psalm 119. I've studied it for years and am writing deeply about it. And one of the most powerful verses in that psalm says, "Is wherewithal, or how is what that word means, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How, how, how can you live the path that God sets before you? Of course, later in the psalm, he tells us that thy word is a light unto our path. It's a, it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. But he asks the question, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And he answers it by taking heed thereto. That is, by looking at the way 
according to thy word. God didn't give us the Bible to learn fancy words and verses, be able to recite things and tell old stories. God gave us the truth of the Bible to show us things that can save our lives. And of course, even our very souls. Peter puts it this way, beginning at verse 15. And I'll read verse 15 through 21 and conclude. He says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. We're to honor the Lord in our lifestyle. And we do that by respecting the price that's been paid for our redemption. He says, as it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Now what he's saying there is not walk around in a sense of terror, of God hitting you upside the head. The concept here of passing the time of your sojourn in fear is to live this life in respect to God and his word, understanding how vital it is to your very survival and success in his service. You know, there's, there's a reason they put the lines on the road. There's places you're on the road you're not supposed to cross. You're supposed to stay on the pavement. You get off in the rough and your ability to steer and remain where you're wanting to go become impaired. You fool around and get on the wrong side of certain lines and you're likely to cause a collision that could harm you and others. For as much as ye know, in verse 18, that you are not redeemed with corruptible things. Pay attention to what it costs God to give you eternal life. That's part of what keeps us between the lines. Is understanding that though salvation has been given to me so that I can receive it free, it did have a cost. And that cost was the life of God's only begotten Son. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Pay attention to what it costs. For you to have life. So that it's no small matter to just say, well, well, you know, I've been good for a few weeks now. I think I owe myself a little party time. You ever had that kind of thought go through your mind? You don't have to tell me. I have a strong suspicion just based on personal experience. And every once in a while we may even succumb to that thought that somehow I've earned a little sin. It's not true. It's not worth the pain it cost the father to give the life of his son. And we can disregard it so easily as to say, well, it, it, it don't matter. God will forgive me. I'm just going to do it anyway. No. You're, you're going off road. Into danger. In a place that you have no idea how you might get out. You'll hear me say this today and maybe some more in, in, in these thoughts about temptation that we go through. Some of you have heard this old saying before about temptation, when you choose the, the way of the enemy, if 
you get in the car with the devil, he'll take you further than you want to go. It's going to cost you more than you want to pay. And he's going to keep you there longer than you want to stay. You can count on that. But think about what you have been given by God in Christ Jesus. Eternal life, peace, joy. Everything you need you can find in him. Some folks think they can find what they need in the arms of a person. In the loving embrace. But understand, God wants to give you someone that can be a blessing to you. Not someone who will harm you. Not someone who will cause you to disobey him. Nobody truly loves you the way they should if their influence on you is to cause you to not do what God has directed you to do. That's a mistake. Some people look for someone to marry and they have in their minds they want this person of great beauty or person of great handsomeness or person of great wealth or whatever. But understand... And they, 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 well, I want somebody that loves me more than they love anything. That's a mistake, too. Because if they love you more than they love God, you are merely an idol. And they'll replace you for another one at some point when another one becomes more enticing. But if you marry somebody who loves God first, that person will love you the way God tells them to. And God tells the man to love his wife as Christ loved the church, willing to give himself for her with his whole life, and tells the woman to love her husband and to reverence him with respect and to honor him. That's what you want. You want what God wants for you. That's what you ought to understand. And if we grasp that in our lives, then these commandments that keep us between the lines that the Lord gives us won't be grievous. They won't be hard. They won't feel like we're losing out. No, the people that you think are getting ahead right now that are 19, 20 years old and look like they got everything, got money, got fame, got all of this stuff, and five years later they're dead in the ditch. Lastly, he says, speaking of Christ, who's been made manifest to us in these last times, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Salvation is the beginning of a Christian's life and service. It's not its goal. We're saved by grace in order to serve with gratitude to God and love for others. Our soul's enemy cannot take our salvation, but he sure can limit our ability to be pleasing to God in spreading the gospel and in being of help to others who are trying to find their way in this world. But we can make the choice. Understand that the rough ride is coming, but understand it's not going to last that long. In a little while, the Lord's coming back. As the old song from the 70s said, it won't be long. It won't be long. Yeah, the ride's going to be rough, but the ride's got an end. And our Savior will be there waiting. When the ride stops, y'all you know, been in those roller coasters that take you up, spin you around, come back down, and the guy, when finally the thing stops bucking, and they pull the lever back and the door opens, when life ends, Christ will be standing there saying, come on out, come on out. Enter into my kingdom. Please stand. It's been a blessing to be with you this morning, and my prayer is that the word spoken and these thoughts would be a benefit to you in your life. The message is directed primarily to believers about the significance of the choices we make in this life as to whether we will honor and serve God with the lives we have, or whether we'll serve ourselves and our own pleasures and lusts and end up unfruitful. To use Paul's words, Paul's word, cast away. We don't have to be like that. 
we can make the choice to live in such a God's provided every resource for a believer to succeed in their spiritual life. But maybe there's somebody here today who doesn't know Christ Jesus as Savior. You haven't gotten to the beginning point of understanding that the weight of sin that you carry, the guilt that you carry because of the mistakes that you've made in your life, the choices that you made in disobedience to God's commands. You don't understand yet that there is a remedy for that. And the remedy is Jesus himself. The remedy is the forgiveness that God freely gives to those who will turn from their ungodliness, turn from their sin, turn from their path apart from God, humble themselves and ask for his forgiveness. He wants to do that. So if the Spirit of God is working in your heart today, come talk to me. Talk to somebody here at Pilgrim Valley. We don't have a, we're still in COVID protocol and not having the altar call and, and come forward, but that doesn't mean conversation can't take place. Conversation can take place after the assembly. If you got questions you want to know, well, how do I do this? How, what do I need to know? What can I do? And as you use the biblical terminology, what must I do to be saved? And if you are, you may want to know, what should I do now that I am? What should I do? God wants you to know. He wants you to follow Christ in baptism, not to be saved, but to identify with Christ as one of his followers. He wants you to join with a group of believers to serve him and to serve one another, to share this word with our dark and dying world. That's what God wants. So as the choir sings, let the Spirit of the Lord speak to your heart. If there's a burden that you're bearing, a weight that you're carrying, you can let it go. You can put it down. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest unto your soul. It's true. It's really true. I'm sure there are many who could give you testimony present here today of the joy their soul knows because they have been forgiven by God through Jesus Christ. Browning, if you would, before you take your seat, I know it'd be harder to get back up. <laughs> Come on up and offer our altar prayer. Thank you, Reverend Smith. Reverend Valley. What a word. That's food for thought. Good food, too. We're going to do our altar prayer this time. The God commanded the church to pray without ceasing. And uh, if you're like me, you don't wait till times get bad before you pray. You also pray when times are good. Now, you know, there's also many different types of prayers. Not just praying for our own self, our own needs, but in this corporate uh, situation, this corporate assembly, we pray for others, we pray for one another. And not just because God commanded us to pray, but because we love one another. Amen. And we want to see everybody do well. We want to see everybody saved. 
saved from the penalty of sin, saved from the bondage of sin. You know, a lot of us are in bondage right now, so we are praying for the world, amen, as well as ourselves and our corporate body. So let us go to God in prayer right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God, we give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor you deserve. You deserve so much praise. We can't praise you enough. We can't say enough. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough tongues to tell you how much we appreciate you and how much we love you, Lord. We worship you and we adore you. We bow down before you. God, we just reverence you today, God. We, we do everything we can, Lord, unlike little children, Lord, to understand you, Lord, you, God. Because we know that your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts. But they are as far as the heavens are from the earth, from us to you, God. So we reverence in our heart and we purpose in our hearts, Lord, that we will try to understand you, Lord, and not trying to get you to understand us. But Lord, we will change our ways to your ways and not try to change you to our ways. But we know we can't change you, God, but you can change us. And we thank you, Lord, that you are working on us individually as well as corporately. And we pray, Lord, right now for this body of believers right now, Lord, that you would lift them up on today, oh God, and, you know, deposit your love in their hearts by your Holy Spirit. That we may be able to know how to love each one another. We may know how to love our neighbors and love those that are loveless. And most of all, Lord, we'll know how to love you because you are love. And without you, God, we won't know how to love. Forgive us, God, for our shortcomings on the day. But Lord, we know that we sin daily, but God, you forgive us. Your grace and your mercy is so good toward us that you will forgive us. But Lord, give us a conscious mind of you, Lord, daily, that we know that your presence is with us daily and that everything, every place we go, we take you with us, Lord. So we will we, be mindful, Lord, of what the places we go, the things we say, the people we hurt, that you are with us, Lord, through all of this. We pray for those that are hurting in the world, Lord, that are hurting mentally, that are hurting spiritually, and that are hurting physically, Lord. Lord, we know that you are able to heal all hurt and pain. But Lord, we understand that life is full of hurt and pain and that some pain are for a purpose. Lord, as we go through these painful times, Lord, we pray that you would show us the purpose for our suffering and the purpose for our pain, oh Lord, that we may be, we may go through it knowing that there's an end, as Reverend Smith said, that weeping may endure for a night, but your word says that joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. We, we don't want to escape the suffering. We don't want to escape the pain, but we want you to take us through it, oh Lord, to the morning time. Thank you, Lord, for the morning. God, we pray right now for our pastor. We lift him up before you right now, Lord. We know that you are doing a work in him right now. You are healing his bones right now, Lord. We just want to say we thank you that you have placed him in this body. You have placed him in our midst. And we appreciate him, Lord. We, sometimes we take him for granted, but we know, Lord, that he is sent and called by you. So, Lord, we will support him as much as we know how to. 
We pray for all the leaders of this church, Lord, all the deacons, all the trustee board, all the choir and the praise team and the ushers and everyone that's got a part in your service, Lord. That you will keep them encouraged, Lord, that we take this higher and higher. And Lord, we will go to another level. We thank you. You have brought us through some turbulent times. And you didn't bring us here for nothing. But we, we've got a purpose for being here, oh God. And we know our purpose. Our purpose is to praise you and worship you, God. And to live a life that will be satisfying in your eyes. Oh, Lord. Oh, God. We fall short. We fall short of the glory. And you know this. And you, but you have made a way for us to escape. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for those that are not able to come, oh God, not be able to be in our presence, God. And we will send your word to them right now. We know that your word does not stall right here in this congregation, but your word can reach far beyond our four walls. And it can go into the neighborhoods. It can go into the states and even all over the world, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you that your word is... Is, is, is moving right now to those that need you. Those out there that don't know you and the part of their sins. Touch them right now, God, as only you know how. It's my prayer for your saints and for those that don't know you in the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. Um, let's uh, proceed with our uh, offering. If the officers would come, following that we'll have uh, communion, have the Lord's Supper, and um, honor the Lord in the remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this offering. We ask that you bless the ones that gave and the ones that were able to give. We ask that you accept this offering in the building of your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Traditionally on First Sunday, Pilgrim Valley honors and remembers the sacrifice of Christ through the observance of the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Physically what it is, is the taking in of implements that represent the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room before his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. And as a part of that meeting, he shared with them a ritual in which he broke bread and spread it out among them. And he had a cup of the fruit of the vine and he shared with each of them. And he explained to them what it represented. He said, this bread, which I break, represents my broken body 
which is broken for you. Broken for your transgressions as a, as a, a consequence of humanity's sin. And he said, this cup represents my shed blood, which is shed for the remission of sin. Without Christ's sacrifice, we could not be saved. Without his willingness to endure the hardships of the cross, we would not have hope. But praise God, he was willing. And he gave his life, shed his blood, and he took back his life three days later. His resurrection is a statement and was a statement to the universe that God triumphed over sin to the benefit of every soul that would believe in Jesus Christ. And as an assembly of believers, we here testify that we understand that we have life now, not just while our heart beats, but we have life forever because of what Jesus did for us. And we partake of this ordinance. We continue to remember Christ in this ritual to remind ourselves that the gift that was given to us, though it was free for us to receive, cost the life of the Son of God. And Paul warned as he wrote to the Corinthians about the observance of this ordinance that it should never be done lightly. It should never be just, well, it's just that thing we got to do at that time. He said, as oft as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And Paul warned, he said, there's some people who are experiencing hardships in their life because they have taken the observance of the remembrance of Christ's death lightly. Just stepped on it. It's like, I, I, I don't want that. I mean, I, I ain't got time for that. Let's just get this over. I got places to go, people to see, things to do. But in this moment, we have to refocus. In this moment, we got to put this afternoon, uh, just put it off for a little bit. Last night, just get that out of your mind. Right now, the focus has to be on remembering who Jesus is and what he means to our souls. Each of you should have received from an usher a cup that has a cover, actually two covers. The top cover, the little multicolored one, it's easy to peel back, peel back the wafer that is within that, and you can take that out. The second one, I found is a little easier to open if you push it down the first time until it clicks. And once it clicks, then bend it back up and slowly peel it and you'll open to the drink. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you and as we prepare our own hearts now and our minds to remember you in this ritual, observing this ordinance, Lord, we pray for forgiveness of our sins. We pray, Lord, that you would remove any sin in us as far as the east is from the west. The distracting thoughts that might be in our mind at the moment, Lord, banish them and help us focus upon you, remembering what you did for us on Calvary. Oh, Lord, we want to honor you in this moment. But not just in this moment. Lord, when we leave from this place, we want to walk out with you on our mind seeking to please you, to do what will honor and glorify you. Lives lived in appreciation for life given. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and for what you have done for us. We will not forget. We will not forget. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
So if you would, and we'll wait on everybody, if you go ahead and prepare to obtain the implements. Anybody need more time? Paul told the Corinthians, he says, tarry for one another. This is something we share together. See no one ask for more time? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I am so glad I've been plunged. Plunged into that cleansing flood. To lose all my guilty stains. Well, let's pray. As we did last week, we'll use for a benediction the closing thoughts of Peter from the fifth chapter of 1 Peter. Please stand. The Apostle Peter, in wrapping up his thoughts, I'm going to go a little further today. Beginning at verse 8 of chapter 5, Peter says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the grace, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And let us all say, Amen. Amen.